ASP.NET Core is still one of the most popular web frameworks for C Sharp. So what has changed in the .NET Core version? In this video, I'm going to walk you through how MVC is set up, how authentication works, and how it's different from the .NET Framework version of MVC. Now, if this is the first video of mine you've watched, my name is Tim Corey, and my goal is to make learning C Sharp easier. One of the ways I do that is by teaching context. There are a lot of tutorials out there that teach you what to do. I go a few steps beyond that to show you when to do it, why you should or should not do it, what the pitfalls are to avoid, and what the best practices are. Basically, I get you ready for the real world. If that's the type of training you're interested in, subscribe to my channel and hit the little bell icon to be notified when I release new videos. All right, let's head over to Visual Studio and start by creating a new ASP.NET Core web project. So we hit next, and let's give us a name. Let's call this MVC Core, and we'll actually, let's change the capitalization there. MVC Core, like so, and we'll call this MVC Core Demo App. So the solution name, we hit Create, and we have this choice of which version do you want to create? Now, I already have selected here the web application, which says Model View Controller. That's what MVC stands for. We're going to choose that one. If you want Razor Pages, that's this one right here, API, of course. And there's some other ones. Just note that these are just templates with other frameworks in them. So this uses JavaScript frameworks in them as well. I prefer not to use those. I prefer to use the straight up uh, projects and then add JavaScript as necessary. This is the MVC project we're going to choose. We're choosing the ASP.NET Core 3.1 version. If you don't have this drop down, you might not have more than one version of .NET Core. But make sure you have the latest. If you scroll down here on the right, you'll notice it says source is templates 3.1.5. That's the latest as of this video's recording. So if you have that number or higher, then you're good to go. Okay. Over here on the right is also some other options. First one's authentication. We're going to turn that on. So we hit change and we'll choose individual user accounts. Now, one of the questions they often get is, hey, can you try out, say, a worker school account or a Windows authentication? And eventually, yes, but not in this video, because the most common thing is for you to create your own authentication system for these smaller apps. If you're building for an enterprise environment, yes, probably a Windows authentication would be great or an Azure AD or something like that. But in this case, we're just going to use the user stored in-app. And by in-app, that means in the app database. So there is a separate database for this that we will look at. We're not going to create or connect to an existing user store in the cloud. We're going to keep this as simple as possible. Hit OK. And note that the configure for HTTPS is checked and you cannot uncheck it. Now that we've added authentication, you can't have a non HTTPS site. That's a good thing. That's a really, I almost wish that this checkbox wasn't here. I wish it always force you to have HTTPS because that's the way the web is going. You really need to have secure communication on the web. So now Google will actually uh, move you down in rank if you don't have an HTTPS version of your site. So just always make sure that's checked. Docker support, we're going to skip for this. And we're going to skip the enable Razor runtime compilation. We're going to deal with Razor uh, pretty much all in this project. OK, and we hit Create. And that will scaffold out for us our MVC project. Now, right off the bat, I want to get something out of the way. This is a question that comes up quite frequently. OK, so which one of these is my, my data access layer? Is that the, the M for MVC? Or which one's your business logic? That's, that's your controllers, right? And the answer to those both is no. MVC is your user interface layer. Yes, it has three parts, models, views, and controllers. But all three of those work together to form one layer. That's your user interface layer. 
So I recommend that when you're doing data access or you're doing business logic that you do not put it in your MVC project directly. You put it in a class library. Okay, so that's out of the way. We now know that's the user interface part. Let's walk through this project and just kind of get a high level overview of what it is and what's happening. Let's start off coming down from the top. We see this www root. In fact, let's zoom in on that. There we go. So www root, this is where all your static files live. And by static files, what I mean is your CSS files, your JavaScript files, your raw HTML files, your, you know, kind of non C sharp web files, uh, all live here. So if you have anything that you want to add to CSS or JavaScript or whatever, that would go inside of www root. Next up, we have areas and areas is where the identity system is. That's where it lives. So we'll look into that in just a minute. And you'll see how all the identity uh, pages are inside there. We can manipulate them as, as needed. Controllers, that is our C in MVC. There is our models, that's the M. And then our views is our V, so MVC. All right, so that's the three parts that make up our user interface. And they also have a data folder. That's, I believe, additional uh, sample stuff. So we'll look at that in just a minute. Another important thing here is startup.cs and program.cs. This is these two files are where the application actually starts because it's kind of like a, it's a console application actually that then runs a web application. But then we also set up all of our configuration for how things get started, how things get set up. And so those are important files to know how to use. Also is the app settings.json. If you're familiar with the old MVC, then we had web.config which is where you put your connection string and you put any um, user secrets or other things that you needed to have in a way that can be easily changed without recompiling your application. Well, now we have appsettings.json. If you're not familiar, appsettings.json is a great system for having a hierarchy of these, these settings. So you can have, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute, but there's appsettings.local or developer. JSON. Well, that's only gets run if you compile for developer mode, but that will override the settings in app settings.json. But then you can override those settings with something like Key Vault, which allows you to have your development settings where maybe you have some user secrets, but you don't want to check those into source control. But then on the server, the real user secrets, the ones that are in for production, your developers never have access to because they're only in Key Vault. And the, the pre-built MVC application will pull from there instead of appsettings.json. So it's a great hierarchy. There's a lot you can do that. I have other videos that cover that. We're not gonna go too far in depth in this video. I just wanna point it out, that's a great system, much better than web.config. We had some ability to override, but not a whole lot. Okay. So let's zoom back out here and let's open up a few of these. First of all, www root. There's our CSS, our JavaScript, and our libraries, which have CSS and JavaScript in it. So there's your bootstrap, jQuery, and jQuery validation. Now, one quick note here. Again, we're gonna have a little bit of comparison. This still is an intro to MVC.NET Core version. So we're gonna make sure you cover the bases here. But I'm also going to talk about if you're familiar with MVC and the .NET framework, because there are some differences. One of the differences we've already noticed is that www root isn't in MVC for .NET framework. Well, another thing though is in Bootstrap and in, in .NET framework MVC, it's Bootstrap three, but this Bootstrap is Bootstrap four. Now. You cannot just upgrade from Bootstrap 3 to Bootstrap 4. It breaks everything because they do things differently. Therefore, you can't just say, I want to upgrade. 
If you're on Bootstrap 3, you can upgrade inside of 3 to the highest version that starts with a major version of 3. You really have to kind of go back to the beginning if you want to go to Bootstrap 4. So this MVC core is on Bootstrap 4. And you can go to the latest version of Bootstrap as long as it's not 5. Okay, which 5 is not out yet as of the recording of this video. Okay, so there's all of our stuff. Let's look at next. Let's go, let's go all the way down to the bottom here. We'll come back up. But I really want to touch on startup.cs and program.cs. Let's do program.cs first. That's this kind of starting point of the application. Notice public static void main. That sound familiar? That's a console application. If we right click on MVC core, go to properties, we'll notice that it's a console application. That's how it's treated. Now, one of the things that's different about .NET Core MVC is that it will run on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. So you can host this on a Linux server, not just a Windows server. The .NET Framework version would only run on IAS on Windows. So this is where we, we basically get things started. And right here it says, hey, go to startup and use that for startup information. Well, let's go to startup and kind of look through all the configuration. Now, note one of the things I love about this, and this is one of the, the ways that Microsoft has really done a great job, is they have named things well. For a long time, they struggled with naming. It was very obtuse to try and figure out what does this mean? Well, now they've gotten better. I'm not saying they're perfect. They're far from perfect. Naming is hard. But if you read through this, it almost reads in a human readable fashion. So right here, configure services. What does this do? Well, this is where you configure all your services. It uses dependency injection by default, and it's the .NET Core built-in dependency injection, which is great. It works for most simple cases. One of the questions people have is, okay, you've taught on Autofac. Do you suggest we use Autofac with .NET Core? And the answer is maybe. To start off with, I would say use the built-in dependency injection. But you may find that in a more complex application, you have to move over to a different dependency injection system. Not a problem. You can just swap it out and put in Autofac here, and it shouldn't have any effect on the rest of your application, except providing you some more flexibility. .NET Core is a very modular and flexible system for doing things like that. Now inside configure services, the first service we configure is our, uh, our application DB context, which is our identity system, which is our security. This is where you create your, you know, the login, the registration page, where you actually uh, figure out who is logged in, store that information, and so on. So right here it says use SQL Server, and then it configures to get the connection string, and that pulls from appsettings.json. So default connection, right in here, connection strings, default connection, there we go. There is our database that it's pulling from, or pulling connection string from. Now if you want to change the connection string name from default connection to, let's say, identity db. You could do that by changing in appsettings.json. Just change it right here. And then you would just change it right here where it passes in which connection string do you want. Well, you change it to identity db instead of default connection. I kind of like not having it named default connection because that would seem to indicate this is our default database. And typically, I don't mix my identity database with my data database. I often get questions on that about why wouldn't you just mix the two databases together? And the answer is security. Because if someone has access to 
mess with my data database, that's bad. But if they have access to mess with my data and my security database at the same time, that's even worse. So that's one reason. There's a whole list of reasons I can go out on a different video about that. If you really want to know, ask the questions down below and maybe I'll add it to my Thursday video list. But having those, those databases separated also allows me to have one used entity framework, which is this identity. And then I use Dapper for all the rest of my data access because I prefer Dapper over identity, or I'm sorry, over entity framework. The next service we add is for identity again. So this, this creates a database information, and this is then uses the identity information, which then wires up that entity framework data store, which we just created. The next thing is where it adds the controllers with views. So it's going to look through the controllers section and find all the controllers that have views. And that's going to add that to our services list. So instead of us manually adding all of our controllers, it's going to do it automatically. So if you create a controller, it's going to add it to dependency injection, which is great. Finally, and this is an interesting one right here, add razor pages. So by default, even though we're in MVC application, it will also support razor pages right out of the gate. So you can just start adding razor pages if you would like. .NET Core, ASP.NET Core was built to be modular. And we talked about that already when it comes to uh, swapping out dependency injection systems, where you could bring in Autofac and replace the built-in one. There's also logging. You can replace the default logger with something more um, like Sarah log, okay? Well, there's also the idea that ASP.NET Core is this base foundation set of, of libraries and systems. And then on top of that is either MVC or Razor Pages or API or, and there's a number of, there's other things you can do with it. Well, that means we don't have to have just one of them. We can mix a couple of them together. We can have Razor Pages and MVC together, which is what is the default. We can even bring in API as well if we want to. We can also bring in Blazor, but it gets a little bit more tricky because Blazor is a bit different. Okay, it's still based upon ASP.NET Core. And in fact, a Blazor server page also has Razor pages enabled by default. So there's a lot of overlap, but there are some tricky setup things that you have to get right with Blazor. So just note that yes, you can do it. It just is a little different. Okay. Now that's, that was the configure services method. Down here, we have the configure method. This is the overall configure. Now it's probably at this point that you're saying, Tim, get to the point. I want to just see MVC work. Tell me how to do MVC. But this is important. And here's why. Because when you're modifying or using this application in the real world, it's not about getting one page to work. It's about getting one page to work in a way that's supported by the entire application. So I would encourage you, don't skip over the startup setup, because if you don't know how to configure this, if you don't look through this and tweak it correctly, then your page, your system will not be set up in a way that's most optimal for use in the real world. For the sake of a demo, you can bypass all of this, but we all know that, that the real world is not a demo. Demos work perfectly and they're easy and they're straightforward and nothing ever goes wrong. But in the real world, it's messy and it's difficult. And you have to tweak things. Maybe you need to bring in razor pages. Well, you need to know how to do that. Okay. So just hang with me and we'll get to the actual MVC pieces of it in just a minute. So the configure section, first of all, notice this right here. This is going to kind of throw you for a, a bit of a loop because it says, Hey, if you're in development mode, use developer exception page and use the developer or use a database error page. What this does, it gives you more information about what's going on. 
It gives you the stack trace on the page whenever you have an exception, those type of things. But if you, if you publish to production, you won't see those same pages. And this is why. Because checking to see if you're in development mode. Well, how does it know if you're in development mode? That's a great question. Let's right click and go to properties on our project. And then let's go to, it's down, I think debug. Yep, there we go. In debug, we have these profiles, IS Express and what's called MVC Core. So IS Express is self-explanatory. MVC Core is the Kestrel login. I kind of prefer Kestrel. Kestrel is that uh, command prompt style window that pops up that will um, give you information in that window. I kind of like it. So I prefer to use that most often, but this allows you to modify both. Now, if you're on a Mac or if you're on Linux, this might look a little different. In fact, if you're on Linux, you're probably doing this through uh, VS Code, which would be a lot different. But even on Mac with Visual Studio, it's going to be different because you don't have IS Express because IS Express runs on Windows. So you'll probably have something a little bit different here. I am going to show in the future, I do have a Mac now, and I am going to work on showing some videos on how to use these things on a Mac. But for now, um, it may be a little bit different. But in here, this is the launch profile for IS Express. Notice that's the default setup right now. Well, in the environment variables, let's zoom in here. Notice that under environment variables, we have this ASP.NET Core underscore environment development. So when you run this profile, it's going to have this environmental variable set to development. Well, that's what it's reading when we say is development. So if you wanted to see what it looks like in production, you would come here and just change this to anything else actually, because by default, if it doesn't recognize it, it goes to production. So you can even remove that if you wanted to. I'd change the value because that way it's, it's just easier than trying to um, trying to remember what it was, ASP.NET Core underscore environment, okay? Now that's for IS Express, but if you choose the Kestrel version, notice there is still that same environmental variable. So you just need to change that if you wanted to see it in a different version. If you wanna see the production version running, even though you're running in development. Now you can also, under properties over here, you can expand this and go to launch settings.json. It'll notice IIS Express, and there is your environmental variable. We also have the MVC core, which you could actually rename if you wanted to, to say Kestrel. You could say Kestrel, and notice it also says that same environmental variable. Now let's save this. If we close this out, notice now it says Kestrel instead of MVC core. I prefer to see Kestrel because that's a little more clear. Okay, so if in development, show developer error messages, otherwise send the error to the slash home slash error page and make sure that HSTS is on, which that's for security and there's more information right there. Okay, so either way, after this is over, we also want to turn on that HTTPS redirection. So if you go to the HTTP version, it's going to redirect you to HTTPS. Notice the, the great naming, because you understand exactly what's going to happen. Use static files that allows you to use the files in www root for things like a static HTML file or something else. Okay, this is where it adds the routing and then it adds authentication, authorization, and finally the endpoints. And this is where we map two different styles of endpoints. The first mapping is our MVC mapping. So map controller route. And this is gonna look similar to what you see in the .NET framework as far as the actual map goes. Now it's a little bit different and we have name and then pattern. It's a little more compact, but it's the same style. 
So we can actually add more than one route if we wanted to. Notice the default route is a standard controller equals home. That's the default value. Action equals index. That's the default value. And then ID question mark, meaning you don't have to have an ID. So if you don't give it any route at all, then it's going to default to slash home slash index and put no ID there. If you give it a route of slash home, then it's going to, going to assume you mean slash index. Okay, so that's the standard route for MVC. You can add more routes if you want to. You could add in something beforehand, like let's say MVC slash controller slash action slash ID. That's kind of silly, but you could because we do something similar for API where we have slash API slash the, the route. Okay, so you could differ, differentiate by doing that, but the standard is just home index and then an optional ID. So that's our MVC route. But notice that there's two routes. The second one is for our razor pages, where it just says map razor pages. So it's gonna look for any razor pages and just map those routes. That does mean you should be careful not to step on toes of having a razor page also map or match a default route. So let's say you have a controller called home, but then you create a home razor page. Well, that would cause some issues because there's it's gonna assume either home slash index or a home razor page. And you don't wanna have that um, the same naming like that. Okay, so we have all of that set up. So let's now look at our actual MVC. So MVC is all around, essentially the, the starting point or the hub or the home is the controller. That is where MVC really gets its power from. So we have the home controller. Now, why do we have the MVC pattern in the first place? Why don't we just have web forms? Well, first of all, just so you're aware, web forms, which is kind of like wind forms, but on the web, they have gone away in .NET Core. We don't have those anymore. Now the benefit there was with web forms is it was just simple. You had your code behind and you had your, your page. And the two were really tied closely together. And that's kind of where we started to figure out a better way because they were tied together. So when it comes to testing, it's very difficult to test your logic of your display without having your display as well. And then you're doing UI testing, and that's kind of kludgy. So with MVC, this controller right here is testable. It's separate from the view. There doesn't have to be a view in order to test these actions. So that's a big benefit of MVC. Now let's look over this controller and just see what's going on. There's a few things different than the .NET framework. First of all, we have a constructor. And this constructor takes or brings in iLogger of type home controller. This is the default logging system inside of .NET Core. I've done other videos on logging in .NET Core that you might want to check out if you're not familiar. It's a great system. Well, that brings in a logger and then assigns it to a private variable. That way we can use this logger in any of our calls. So that's, that's one thing that's different than the .NET framework. Now we have the index action, which is the default action. You should always have an index action on your controllers. Because remember, we have that default of index. So if we say just slash home, it's going to come to the home controller, and then it's going to, by default, look for the index action. If you don't have one, that would be an issue. So make sure you always have an index action unless you change the defaults. If you change the defaults, make sure you follow and have those default values. The same thing is true with the home controller. You wanna make sure you have a home controller, but again, the default is home. All right, so on the index action, it just returns view. What does that mean? Well, in the views folder under home, there is an index.cshtml. 
This is the view portion of this MVC relationship. So for the home controller, the index action, when it says return view, it's gonna return the view home index page. That's this page right here, where it says welcome. Right, we'll see that in just a minute. Instead of index, we could say slash privacy and return that view, which that's under home privacy. And there is that view. Now, the last one's a little bit more tricky, and that's the error page. Instead of returning just an empty view, it's gonna return a view with the, the activity ID. It's gonna check that first and get the, um, the trace identifier. So either of those is gonna grab, and then from there, it's gonna return, but notice up here, it says response cache. What this is saying is, hey, don't cache my information. No cache, no store, duration of zero. Basically, don't store or don't cache the call. That way it always has the latest version. It always has the most up-to-date information. Up here, it may be fine to cache this page, which just means that instead of actually going here and asking for this page over again, it's going to go to um, a, a locally stored uh, version of this page, grab that and display it instead. That caching allows us to save a lot of traffic, but it can bite us because if we have a cached version of a page, but there's new data and it doesn't realize that, then it's going to give you the old version with old data. And that's not a good thing. So on the error page where it's important, it's turned off the cache. The nice thing is there's a great example for you of how to turn off caching. Now the other tricky bit here is that if you look for error, notice home, there's no error page here. But under shared, there's an error page. In the shared folder, everyone has access to these. So therefore, it's like it's in the home controller, but it could be like it's also in a different controller as well. So this error page can be displayed basically from anywhere. Now this does highlight on this page a couple of the differences that we can see from .NET Framework. And they really revolve around how we display data. So notice the class text-danger, that's a, a bootstrap uh, class, okay? And I believe it's a little different in Bootstrap 3. I'm not positive on that one. I do know that some of the things that are different in Bootstrap 3 versus 4 show up but that might not be one of them. But just note that that might be a little different than you see in .NET framework version of MVC, which means you can't just copy your views from MVC 3 to MVC 4. Or I'm sorry, from MVC with Bootstrap 3 to MVC with Bootstrap 4. So from .NET framework to .NET core. Okay, you can't just copy them. You can mostly copy them and just change the the... Uh, class names to match the new Bootstrap 4, and you could probably get with with tweaking some pages and getting them mostly copied over. It's just, it's not a, a simple process, which is why there is no direct upgrade process from MVC in the .NET framework to MVC in .NET Core. All right, now let's look at, we've got the, the controllers, we've got the views, Notice we, we haven't talked about models yet. And that's one of the things that kind of trips people up is they're like, well, where the models are the data access, correct? Because they kind of get, you know, keep reverting back to that, well, there's got to be three layers here somewhere. And no, the models are all about displaying data, which means if you look at models, there is one model and that's for, this is the error view model. And this is, just information about displaying data. That's all it is. It's not for transporting data. It's not from the database necessarily. All you can bring database models and put them right on a page and use it as your model. It's sometimes in production not always advisable because you wanna make sure you have the ability to change that model for display purposes. So often you'll see people translate using something like AutoMapper translate or transfer data from one model to another that looks very, very similar. And that's because 
the models in this folder are typically all about display. So they have things like uh, validation information and how the, the naming gets set up. So maybe request ID, the display name is request space ID or something like that. So that's all UI specific stuff. You wouldn't have that in your, your DTO, your data transformation object or transportation object. Um, so in that case, then you want to make sure that you have the model in your MVC models folder. But there may be times when this model folder isn't really used that much. It all depends on your scenario. And that's one more timeout here to talk about. And that is there is no one right answer. Software development is much, much more complex than that. And there's much, much more or many, many more options available to you. So it's not a matter of saying which one is best. Because if you watched my course on which ASP.NET Core, you'll find there's five different options, even inside of ASP.NET Core, and that there isn't one scenario where I say, okay, this is the only way of going. There's definitely options available to you. In fact, I personally almost never use MVC anymore. Now I'm teaching it here. Why? Because it's also one of the most popular web frameworks for C Sharp out there. And even the .NET Core is still pretty popular. The reason why is because people understand it. They know it. They know how to work with it. And businesses don't just turn on a dime. So they don't just say, okay, you know, we're going along, we're building this .NET Framework MVC application and .NET Core comes out, they're like, okay, we're going to change. And then Blazor comes out, they're like, you know what, we're going to change again. That's, that's too much time and effort and money to change over your back end to get no different or very little different results. So typically you'll see organizations lagging behind the cutting edge stuff by a good five years because they're just trying to make the application do what they want, not necessarily stay on the cutting edge. So for all of those reasons, MVC is still probably the most popular, or one of the most popular .NET framework or .NET core C-sharp applications out there for the web. Even though it's not my favorite, it's still a really popular one to use. So I definitely don't discount MVC, but just note there are different ways of doing things. So when, when you're thinking about asking a question, just think through it may, the result you may get or the answer you may get, maybe it depends. And that's not a way to get out of answering the question. It's because your scenario might be different than my scenario. So when I talk about these transformation objects and having a, uh, a model that's only in MVC, it's only in the, the UI and it's a display model. You may not have that scenario because your environment may be different or I might not have very many of them and someone else might have a lot. It all depends on your specific scenario. And by scenario, I don't just mean what your application is you're building. That's part of it. But another part is what is your team familiar with or how much separation do you want or what are the changes coming down the road that you might anticipate or, you know, what is, what is your skill level at? What's your team skill level at? These are all questions that have to be evaluated before you can get a good solid answer on what's the best path. This is why people pay me so much money to consult because it takes a lot of work and it's not this uh, prescriptive thing where I can say, okay, here is the solution for everybody. Okay. So it does take a very, very specific scenario to be evaluated before you can get the quote unquote right answer. And even there, there's still going to be a lot of room for different ways of going about the same solution. So just note that, think that through, um, if you start getting testing the comments about how this is the right way or this is the wrong way, I'm going to yell at you because that's, that's way too 
generalize an answer, way to generalize a thought process. It's much more nuanced than that. Okay, so that's a little soapbox for now. Okay, let's go look at data. Ah, data is for the migrations. So there's the migration support for our entity framework, and there's our application DB context, which note, this just overrides the base, passes our options in, but it doesn't really have any, any changes, which we could put changes in there if we wanted to. Let's look at areas. The areas folder, this is where the identity pages are located. Notice that right now we only have one page and that's the underscore view start page, which just says, hey, that's the, that's the place to go to start. We can add more pages by adding scaffolding. So we can right click on areas, we could say add new scaffolded item. We could choose identity down here, select identity, wait for it to build out, and then it will allow us to, to set up additional pages we can override. So we can bring this in and notice here's all the pages we could override. Now you have to select um, a couple of things, your data context class, which we already have, and then your user class. And then you can also, I'm not sure why it's grayed out there, but you can also override the files. What that will do is allow you to, to modify the files as necessary. So if you don't like how the confirm email change page looked, well, you can modify that by just making sure that's checked and hitting add, and then we'll add it in this identity section. You can change it, and now it's changed for you. The cool thing is, if you decide, you know what, I like the original better, just delete that page, and it will use the default instead. Now let's cancel out of that. We're not gonna actually gonna do it. And that's all there is to identity. Well, almost. There is one other section. If we go back down, let's shrink some of these down here so we don't have tons. And right down here under shared actually is our layout page. And this is where our actual HTML page gets its start, okay? So here you see the doc type of HTML and the, the HTML language equals English. We have our header and we have our body, which our body has a header, which is a little confusing, but that's uh, bootstrap four for you. So in here, there's one extra line we should note about, notice. And that's the partial name equals underscore login partial. This is where we get our login section in our navigation menu. Well, what's this login partial? Well, login partial is right here. It's in the shared folder. This is where in the nav bar, if you're signed in, then you get these links. If you're not signed in, then you get these links. Notice these links are register and log in. If you are signed in, it's going to say hello and your username. Now, I haven't pointed this out. I assume you have some base knowledge of ASP.NET core or regular, but if not, notice that this right here, this at symbol, okay, that is saying, hey, we're gonna mix in some C sharp here. This is the razor syntax. Not to confuse the razor pages, or razor components. Those are all separate things. This razor syntax is that at symbol that says, let's, this is an HTML page, but inside the HTML page, let's bring in some C-sharp code. In this case, let's grab the user.identity.name, which is, would probably be my email address. And then notice the exclamation point at the end, that's actually back to HTML. Razor syntax is, um, smart enough to know, oh, that's not C-sharp anymore, therefore it must be HTML. And we have some more down here. This is actually a whole method. And then we have an if statement as well. Notice the at if, and then this gets run with the else, and this gets run. So it's, it's really smart about knowing how to mix the two together. In any event, let's go to Kestrel, and let's log in and run this thing. Or at least run it. Not sure if we'll log in or not. Notice there's my Kestrel window. 
which is going to pop up with some information about what's going on. Not a ton right now. We can look into why that is in just a minute. I'll show you. But then we have our welcome page. This is a standard uh, ASP.NET Core welcome page. So this is what MVC looks like. It's practically the same as what Razor Pages or even um, API would look like if you had a, a UI for it, which would probably be MVC or, or Razor Pages. But if you go to privacy, notice the slash home slash privacy is now the route. If we go to home, it takes everything off that route because it uses the defaults. We can also go to register or log in. And one thing to note here, this is helpful. There is, you can log in with other external authentication systems. So if you want to see that, click this article here. And then it's going to go to this page right here, the docs.microsoft.com, which is very well done. And it allows you to see how to use Facebook, Google, and other external providers with ASP.NET Core. It talks you through all the steps, including how to man put it into your uh, secrets manager, such as uh, Key Vault, so you can make sure you secure, secure that data. And it talks about using multiple providers, has options at passwords, and so on. There's a lot of stuff in here, really good stuff. And if you have a question, you can even leave some feedback on this page right here. So really great stuff here. I really appreciate how the documentation has come along. If you want the step-by-step, -step, there you go. There's the steps to add Google authentication. There's Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and other. So that's, that's that piece of it. But let's go back to our page. Let's go to register and just register real quick. Now, one of the things I have not done is create my database. The nice thing is if you do this in developer mode, you hit register, it's going to go, oh, no, you're not, you're not set up. You need to apply existing migrations before you can do anything. The cool thing is, let's zoom in here. The cool thing is that it says in Visual Studio, you can use the package management console and run this command right here. If you're on the command prompt, you can run this command right here. So really clear here what to do. This allows you to not only do it this time, but next time, whether you're deploying it to a different environment or you're deploying it to production or whatever the case may be, this is how you do it to make sure that you uh, get your database created. All right. So in our case, the really cool thing is, oops, I just zoomed in there a lot. Uh, really cool thing is this button right here. It says apply migration. This is a really nice shortcut. I click this button. It says applying migrations. And then what I have to do is I'm going to have to refresh this page. And I hit continue. Because it says confirm form resubmission. Well, yes, that's what I want to do. And now it says, hey, cool. Um, you've, you've started this process, but here's the thing. Your app does not have a real email sender registered. Okay. But here's the really cool thing. See these docs on how to configure a real email sender. All right. So what this is, is when you go to um, register a real user, you want to let the user register themselves. Well, one of the things you're going to do is they're going to put in test at test.com or a at b.c you know, some weird email address that might technically be formed as an email address, but isn't a real email address. Well, that's not something you want to allow to be used as a real account. So what you do is you send them an email and you say, hey, click this link to confirm your account. Well, that's great, except in development, we don't have a real email sender registered. So in development, we can click here to confirm your account, basically as if this link were given to us in an email. So for development purposes, this is great. You just click this link, you're good to go. Production, this is not great. You don't want to do that. But see these docs? Well, if you open these docs up, 
again, docs.microsoft.com. Here's how to set up an email provider such as SendGrid so that you can send out emails to get those confirmations back. Now, once you set up a, and there's a lot of instructions here, but it's really clear how to do it. You can also enable QR code generation, uh, cookie authentication. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. It may be a little geeky, but reading these docs is really enlightening. It's gonna tell you a lot of information about identity, which may be more than you wanna know, but at the same time, you know, enabling QR code for generation and identity, that's kind of cool. So maybe you want to do that. And so you can click here and figure out how to do that. And it's not that much work. Okay. Anyways, rabbit trail. So with that information, you can set up your, your emailer so you can confirm accounts. But not only that, once you do that, you also have the ability, there'll be a link that will show up that will allow the user to say, hey, I forgot my password and they fill out their email address or maybe some other information, and it's gonna email them a link they can click on to put a new password in. So you have to set up your email provider first before you can have that forgot password link show up, okay? Just note that. All right, so we're gonna click here to confirm our account. We've confirmed. We're still not logged in, but if I hit log in now, and I log in with my really secure password, I hit log in. Now it says, hello, Tim, I am Tim Corey and log out. The reason it changed this, remember, is because of that, um, that one page. Let's go back to Visual Studio real quick. And that one page in the uh, layout where we have this login partial. And then in the login partial, we have if sign manager dot is signed in for this user, if they're signed in, then say, hello username and have that log out button. Okay, that's what we're seeing right now. If they're not logged in, then we see the register and log in. That's what you used to see. All right, so that's how that works. Okay, so that that's really how MVC works in .NET Core. Now I haven't gone too far in depth with actually creating pages. Notice that, let's just do it real quick, I'll show you that if you create a new action, let's just, let's just copy this for, for instance. There we go. And now instead of index, we'll call this uh, Tim, a Tim action, because you gotta have a Tim action. And you can right click on this and say add view. And we'll say a razor view. Nope, we want an MVC view inside here. Well, it's gonna create a razor view for me. Excellent. That's not what I wanted. Uh, it may be fine. Let's find out. Okay, it's actually gonna create a, a view. That's interesting. That's not, I think that's a bug. Let's try it again. So add view. Let's go with razor view, not empty, but the actual razor view. Okay, I think this is right, but I don't like the naming, the razor view. That's just not right. Okay, so we have the name Tim in the template. Do you want it to be empty without a model? Or do you want it to be a create, a delete, a details, an edit, a list? These are really helpful at first, okay? And what they're really helpful for is creating kind of this, um, the default page, okay? The default for, let's say a model, a person model with first name, last name, email address, and phone number, okay? Those four properties. Well, if I create a create page for that model, I have to find the model on the list. But if I did, then what it would do is it create a page where you create a new person. And so it have a form with first name and a form with last, you know, with last name and email address and phone number and a submit button. So that's what it would, that's what, how it would work, okay? Now, if I use that same model, but instead had a list, what I would expect is a list of person, and then I'd create this layout where it displays the first name, the last name, the email address, and the phone number for each person in the list. So that's really great for showing you how to kind of you know, start off on this page. Maybe you wanna change a lot of how it works, but at least it gives you a good starting point. But if you don't have a model that you're sending, like we don't, 
just create empty. Now we're not going to do a partial view. We are going to reference the script libraries and using the default lay the layout page, but it's default, which is the blank option. Basically, you don't have to change any of these things. Hit add. What it's going to do is in the home folder, it's going to put a new file. There we go. So now we have a new file called Tim. And this page is really spectacular. I'm going to say Tim Corey and then say Tim, let's put in paragraph tag as we complete. Tim was here. That's my amazing page. Let's launch Castrol here. Oh, I almost forgot to show you about the, um, the logging window. Let's do that in just a minute. So there's no link up here, but if I were to say slash home slash Tim, there's the Tim Corey, Tim was here page. Okay. So that's how you'd add a new page. And of course you could add more data. You can send data from the home controller through the view or to the view, uh, through this view method call. Okay. We can see that in, in here where he's sending error information through. So that's, that's MVC. I do have another video on MVC for the .NET framework on this channel, still very valid to check out. You should know both. And that's a question I often get asked. Should I know just.net core stuff? And the answer is no, unless you're only doing cutting edge new stuff. But like I said earlier, if you're going to work for a business, more than likely you're going to work on stuff that's not cutting edge. It's a few years old to a decade or more old. Therefore, you should know both the .NET framework and .NET core. The good thing is that it's not about the C-sharp code. The C-sharp code is practically the same. The difference is going to be the structure of MVC. Actual views, controllers, and models, they're almost practically identical. The difference is going to be in startup.cs and program.cs, appsettings.json, those kind of things. They're a little different. Also bootstrap four. So there are some differences, but the C sharp itself, pretty much the same stuff. So with that, let's look at our logging. Now, before I said that we have to go to appsettings.json and look at logging. Well, there is the default logging information. So you got the default is log information messages. But for Microsoft, log warning, and for Microsoft.hosting.lifetime, log information. I've got a logging video on this channel that goes into more detail about how this all works. But I do want to point out one other thing. And that is if you expand this, there's appsettings.development.json, which has other settings as well. So if you were to change, so notice the default is information, then warning, then information again, just like before. Information, warning, information. But if you go to appsettings.json and say, you know what? I want to see information. This is going to change nothing because this is the appsettings.json. Since we're running in development mode, the development version is going to override the main version. So instead of changing it here, let's undo, change it in appsettings.development.json. Let's change this to information. And now let's launch Kestrel. And you'll see a whole lot more information pop in this window. Notice that you see diagnostic information. You see bootstrap, bootstrap.bundle.min.js was not modified. There's information in here that is is relevant to what you're looking for possibly. Now there's a lot of information here, so that's why by default it's turned off. Now if you go to the privacy page, notice I just went there and something happened. I clicked it off the screen. But notice we get the, the 200 error or 200 message right here, which means success for text.html. And we've got more information about, oh, we went to mvccore.controllers.homecontroller.privacy. That's the endpoint we triggered. Okay, so there's more information about what's going on in this page. 
In fact, up here, you can even see that, first of all, the request was on home slash privacy, but then we also see down here that we have a route matched with, so we know that why it matched this route. Well, it matched the action of privacy, the controller of home, no page, no area. What this means is that maybe you have a page that's not going to the right spot and you're not sure why. Well, if you turn this on, you can find out why it matched a certain route and say, oh, it's matching the route for Razor Pages instead of MVC because it's got a naming issue. You change the name, you're good to go. So that might be um, how you can diagnose more easily what's going on. So just note that get, to get more information like this on the screen, you have to go into your app settings.development.json and change this line right here to be information. Since this line right here overrides this line right here, this becomes information even though it's warning right now in app settings.json. Okay, so that was a lot of information about kind of the, the surface level of MVC, how it's configured, how it runs, and the basics of how to get started in MVC. There's a lot more to cover. And quite frankly, I could spend another three or four hours on MVC. In fact, I did in my whichasp.net core course. But this at least gives you a good overview to get started or at least know how the system works. So my question now is, do you want more information on MVC? What specifically do you want to hear about when it comes to MVC? Are you looking for a lot more deep dive into creating controllers and creating views? Or are you looking for how to do data access? Which hint, this is all user interface. So when it comes to data access, that's a class library. So it works the same way as it does for a WPF application. Yes, I said that right. A desktop application has the same data access as an MVC application. So just think that one through for a little bit. But if you have other questions about MVC or about how to do authentication differently or, or those kind of things, ask them down in the comments below, okay? I keep track of comments. I keep track of uh, requests for things. And as the, the pressure grows for something, it comes out, okay? So as the pressure grows for a certain topic in MVC, I'll probably put a video out about it, okay? So it really takes your feedback in order to get videos that you're looking for, all right? Now, if you're not a big MVC fan, um, like I'm not really, um, but again, business is, so you should learn it. Um, what other frameworks do you want to see? I know that WebAssembly Blazor is a, a highly requested one. That's going to come soon um, because, again, you asked for it. But, you know, what are you looking for? Okay, leave them down in the comments. I'll read them. I'll try to respond, at least say, okay, I put in a list. And then um, based upon that, I'll it'll, uh, guide my future videos. Okay, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.